Book of the Dead. Book of Crossroads. No. Divana Spellbook. Handbook for the recently deceased. Oh! The Necronomicon. Attercart, Attercart. Soon, a limited power shall be mine? Some time later. Necronomicon. <laughs> hey, I just fixed. <gasps> My package! Finally, with the power of the Necronomicon, I'll be able to... Uh oh Anthology. A collection of works or stories usually of a similar theme presented together to the audience in one neat package. Now, I'm quite the fan of a good anthology movie myself. One of the first I ever saw was 1982's Creepshow, a collection of spooky shorts presented in a Tales from the Crypt EC Comics theme. You'll scream at ghastly ghouls, cringe at weird kids. And it was because of 1982's Creepshow that I did not like Leslie Nielsen growing up, and why I cried when my family put on the Naked Gun movies at Christmas. And it wasn't until Mel Brooks's Dracula, dead and loving it, that that particular scar healed. Who in all of England, by the very furthest stretch of the imagination, could possibly be a vampire? Count Dracula. Well, maybe him. Oh. What? What? It's a good movie. Anyway, people have pretty great things to say about Creepshow, as well as many of the other modern horror anthology movies, like Trick or Treat. There's another tradition. Mm. Always check your candy. And VHS. Which one is it? I don't know, man. Let's just look at these tapes, okay? But I want to tell you about 1993's Necronomic... Necronomicon Ex Mortis. Not that one. 1993's Necronomicon. And as this is technically three and a half short stories with very straightforward plot, I think it's fair to say most of the major plot twists and turns will be looked at. So, yeah? Spoilers, I guess? Our wraparound story begins with H.P. Lovecraft himself. Yes, I have an appointment. Howard P. Lovecraft. Showing up at a library of monks in order to do some research for his stories. And after using the sleight of hand skill, Lovecraft finds the tome of ancient and forbidden knowledge, the Necronomicon. Our passageway into the three shorts used for this film, each by a different director, and then he drops the key. You know, they didn't call him ham-fisted Lovecraft for nothing. Our first story, The Drowned, is about Edward de Loper, who seems to have inherited an old family hotel that has a strange and mysterious cavern and pit combo in the basement. And here we have the main foyer, bedrooms, upstairs, downstairs, mainly storage. Edward learns a bit about the tragic history of his family, she died quite young, quite tragically. Before he takes us into a flashback where he sees his wife's death. Ah! Uh, oh, what a weird Hydro Morgue you fellas got here. Almost looks sinister in nature, what did you say? But before the inevitable storm rolls in, giving us this beautifully cheesy music video shot, leading us to Edward reading up on his uncle's demise. I am writing under an appreciable strain. Since by tonight I shall be no more. Turns out old Jethro Deloper lost his whole family in a shipwreck during a similar stormy night. Okay, Jethro. Your entire family is dead. Your world is crumbling around you. Oh, no. And action. Why? Why? Oh. Oh. And after washing his hands of God, he gets a brief visit from one mysterious fish man. Time of me, you are not alone. Strepsils <laughs> helps a sore throat back into shape. Oh, how kind of you! I've always wanted my own tome of darkness. Jethro uses a magical ritual from this book to bring his family back to life. That is not dead, which can the eternal lie. And with strange eons. Even death may die. In his lair, Cthulhu waits dreaming. Oh, oh he, he said it, he said it. 
And of course, Jethro's dead son and wife come back from the dead. <laughs> but it's like my friend Judd always said. Well, sometimes that is better. Back in the future, Edward starts a frantic search for the Necronomicon in the hotel library. But after some inappropriate tentacle touching in his sleep, Edward discovers the spooky book hidden away in the walls and tries the spell out himself. That is not dead, which can eternal lie. And with strange eons, even death may die. The spell seems to work as a dead Clara Deloper shows up, acting like some kind of spider lady, before getting pretty gross with her tummy kisses. <laughs> and soon Edward learns that girls don't have a giant umbilical cord coming out of their back. Don't push me away! <gasps> and attacks the fake dead wife, who lets out a familiar scream. It turns out there's a monstrous thing living under the hotel that Edward has to deal with. So he flips the switch, turning this horror short into a Pirates of the Caribbean fan film, with Edward Errol flinning his way through the scene and stabbing the giant beholder in the eye. Excuse me, but did that monster just let out a death fart? Oh my god, are you still farting? And just like that, our first story is done. Back in the world of the wraparound, Howard senses a rumbling in the waters down below. And the room starts getting cold, segueing us into our second tale, the aptly named, uh, The Cold. The Cold starts with a report... Eddie? Eddie Spaghetti? B -b but the last time I saw you, you... <laughs> Never mind. Uh, reporter Dale Porkel investigates a series of murders in a local house. What the hell happened to Madden? Where the lady that lives there tells him about the story of her mother Emily and how she moved into the super chilly cold house many years ago. But after a dire encounter with her stepfather and her getting saved by the mysterious upstairs tenant, Emily gets all patched up by Dr. Madden, who keeps his apartment super chilly by the way. Frigid temperature is not by choice. I'm afflicted by a, a rare skin condition. Uh-uh. Strange and mysterious disease, you don't say? Uh-huh. And he sends her on her way so that he can leak in peace. Like scientists do. That's disgusting. Later, Emily awakes to the sound of some impromptu science happening and some man-jam extraction, before later getting assured that she was just dreaming. First of all, Doctor, you? And second of all, that was entirely preventable. Why were you even holding a scalpel? You were taking off a bandage. But things aren't sitting right with Emily, and she gets super suspicious of the doctor and her missing stepdad. Even if Sam did survive the fall, I would have killed him for what he did to you. I don't care what you did to Sam, but you lied to me. Oh, oh, so you're fine with murder. It's that a recent acquaintance wasn't being 100% honest with you. That's, that's what got you all riled up. But it turns out, Dr. Madden has been using some techniques from the Necronomicon to prevent his own death. Hence why he has to stay so cold. But Emily gets steamy with the Iceman and... Oh, God, is he leaking again? But sometime later, after some scuffling and a blast of fire, it seems as though time is up for Dr. Freeze here, as he starts melting. Meanwhile, Emily gets attacked by Lena, but ultimately gets spared because of her being pregnant with the little fetusicle. Pregnant with his baby. <laughs> oh, oh, sorry, I got all sleepy and cuddly during your story. But the reporter starts to put things together. Well, I have this sick hunch that you and your mother are the same person. And of course, gets the full scoop from Emily and Lena, who is wearing some of the worst old person makeup I have ever seen. I stand by that fact. After all this coldness, it's quite surprising that it's so hot over here at HP. Guess that leaking scene got him all hot and heavy under the collar. It also seems as though the monks are on his trail, thinking he might be up to something. As we start looking at story number th- Is that a- Is that a butthole? I know that this isn't a- Sigil of unlimited power and destruction. I now know it's a butt. As we start story number three, 
whispers. While chasing down a killer known as the Butcher, two cops seem to be arguing over their failed relationship and the baby they have on the way. I'm scared to be a mother. Instead of keeping their focus on the damn driving. Watch out for that inconspicuous ramp! Oh great, now we're upside down. Your partner's getting dragged off, we have no backup. <sighs> Might as well follow this auspicious trail of blood. I, yeah, all the way down this murderous corridor. Down the spooky shaft and watch where you go! Ah! I'm really sorry, dude, but I don't think Sarah's coming to save you. Oh, but thankfully, Sarah, police brutality. But thankfully, this kind and caring man is here to help you out. The man you're probably looking for is the butcher. So where can I find this butcher? Well, technically, he's supposed to pay me rent because I own this building top to bottom. He agrees to lead Sarah down to the killer known as the butcher. I want to get down below. I want to get down now. Oh, why didn't you say so? And along with his blind shotgun toting friend Rose here. Oh, and I guess they also have the Necronomicon. Weird. It's almost as though this was an afterthought by the director. <laughs> yeah. But it also sounds like these two people are kind of kooky. I bet he didn't tell you the butcher's an alien. And it also turns out there's some mysterious, weird, hidden tunnels tucked away deep under Philadelphia. Who'd have guessed? Oh, I love pictograms. Let's see what they say. Uh, uh, something about limbs getting hacked off. O almost in a, a butchered kind of way. You, and then being offered to a, a, a some sort of snake thing? Huh. It's weird. Deeper into the caves, Sarah makes a weird discovery about some shoes. A man's shoe is dirty. Got to wonder about his soul. Before she gets a surprise encounter from Rose. But the horror she finds below gets topped after she finds the animated husk of her former partner, along with some weird winged monstrosities. It's me. Oh, that's disgusting. Turns out these guys are fans of brain swapping and drinking human goop. But thankfully, Sarah wakes up in the hospital, just like in The Wizard of Oz. And you were there? And you? And you were there? Oh god, even you! Oh. <laughs> but as the youth say, psych, Sarah is actually still below them caves, getting her limbs slurped like a smoothie, before sweet, sweet madness takes her mind. HP. That was a wicked one. Oh, and finally those monks are catching up to your shenanigans. Oh shit. Oh shit. Oh shit. Murderous monster monks, portals, little Cthulhu, and now Langoliers? <coughs> Thankfully, HP manages the old bait and switch, saving his own skin, no offense, and fleeing to fight another day. Oh, uh, you find what you're looking for, Mr. Lovecraft? I'd say, it found me. Truly? Truly a story for the ages? <coughs> Anyways, <coughs> Necronomicon was helmed by three directors. There's French director Christophe Gans, responsible for the far more Poe-like segment, The Drowned, who I mostly only know from this, Brotherhood of the Wolf, and the Silent Hill film adaptation, which I know a lot of people have mixed thoughts on, but it sure has some great scenes, doesn't it? That's rad. And then we have Japanese director Shusuke Kaneko, who handled the cold story segment. The only real one with plot. Who I only know from a bunch of his kaiju movies. And the Japanese live-action Death Note movies. And last, American Brian Yusna, who directed the library wraparound and Whispers, who has either produced, wrote, or directed some of the greatest works in horror film, 
such as the Reanimator movies, Dolls, and Society. I mean, the guy even worked with Stuart Gordon on Disney's Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. Let me repeat that. Stuart Gordon and Brian Usner, known body horror specialists, made a Disney movie about a scientist that morphs and changes their loved one's bodies in pursuit of science. Checks out his body horror, I guess. And not only did Yuzna work on the story, and the directing, and the producing, he even stars in a small role as the cab driver who took HP to the library. Now as for the visual effects, the legendary Tom Savini was supervising this whole shebang, pretty much. With extensive work from John Carl Beekler, who has worked on such hits as Friday the 13th Part 7, Nightmare on Elm Street Part 4, and From Beyond. And let's not forget Screaming Mad George, who has had a hand in a smorgasbord of mainstream as well as B-movie legends. The best effect in my opinion is of course the deep one from The Drowned. And no, it's not just because I like fish men. It's the amount of personality in his design. It's just so palpable. His clothes betraying his former humanity. The bandages across his face that once hid his changing visage. Plus, he has a dope hat. Some effects that were just literal grossness. Like pretty much everything involving the doctor from the cold just gives me the dry heaves. No, please, no. no. <coughs> there are, of course, some misses, though. The early CG, that just kind of looks like some Photoshop gag. And don't even get me started on the flappy things and whispers. The limited motion just makes them look like rejected Jim Henson pieces when they're being puppeteered. Necronomicon has a boatload of actors from a boatload of other things, so to go in depth with all of them would be insane. But here are my favorites. Richard Lynch, who some of you might know as Major Krause from Puppet Master 3. Like looking into a mirror, is it not? And David Warner, who famously got his head cut off in 1976's The Omen. <laughs> And also Don Kalfka, who played my favorite character, Ernie, in 1985's Return of the Living Dead. Dude, you, you, you just can't burn animals alive. It's just too hideous, isn't it? At least let me kill them first. Take them out in the parking lot and put them out of their misery. But a big hats off and standing ovations to Jeffrey Combs, who played Lovecraft in the wraparound. And honestly, this is one of the best makeup jobs I've ever seen. Just look at this transformation. Yeah, I don't care that he looks like a nerdy Bruce Campbell. This looks amazing. I mean, just compare, huh, and huh. And Jeff, of course, is no stranger to these kinds of movies. Him being the patron saint of many Lovecraftian films, and also starring in some we'd rather not talk about. Howard, stop! Magic only increases the tears between dimensions. And of course, if you're a Star Trek fan, I'm sure you've seen him there a whole heap of times. My big takeaway from Necronomicon is that this is a movie for fans. And if you're into these kinds of stories and these kinds of effects, then you're just gonna have a great time. I'm not saying the layman won't have a fun time, but you sure are in for a wild ride if you are. And of course it has faults, it has some bad effects, it has some weird camera transitions. What's with these fades? And sometimes the exposition feels kinda, you know, what? But I mean, these are short stories. What did you expect? So all in all, Watch it. Give it a gander. I can guarantee it's better than sitting around having a stick in your eye. So thanks for your time watching this one. Now if you'll excuse me, I have something to go order. Again.